Uh, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Picking it up in verse 14. Mark chapter 6, verse 14. Now, King Herod heard of him, speaking of Jesus, and his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are, are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I have beheaded or whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. And we'll get to that question later on uh, about who do you say that I am. Herod's struggling with that question right here. For verse 17, Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias <clears throat> held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he, he did many things and, and uh, heard him gladly. Then an opportune, an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced, and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Anybody traditionally know what her name was? Daughter? Salome. Salome, yeah, that's right. One way that you say it. Yeah, salami is another way to say it. And, uh, <laughs> So Herod swore to her, whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. She must have been some kind of a dancer. <laughs> so she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent and uh, sent an executioner and commanded uh, his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. We... As Christians, will impact others, directly or indirectly, and not always in a positive way. Now, in this case, Herod had heard of Jesus, but what he was hearing confused him and thought that it might be John the Baptist come back from the dead. Now, we look back on Jesus' own rejection in his own hometown back in the beginning of chapter 6, and not only from those that knew him best, even those in his own family. And they rejected him because they thought they knew him. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this his mom? Isn't this his brothers and his sisters? We know them all. So why should we respect this guy? And they rejected him just on the basis of the fact that they thought they knew who he was. He's the carpenter. They didn't realize not only is he the carpenter, he's the Messiah, the anointed of God. Now here, Herod has a similar moment where he made assumptions about Jesus and John that were not really true. Now the backstory here is that really verses uh, 17 to 29 is parenthetical. In other words, what's recorded in verses 17 to 29 had happened previously. And, and Mark, the writer here of, of this gospel, who probably got most, if not all, of his data from the apostle Peter, adds this in just for a little bit of backstory. So when we hear Herod saying, this is John the Baptist raised from the dead, one reader might be looking at it going, John, what, wait a second, what happened to John the Baptist? 
last I heard, he was baptizing by the Jordan, and now all of a sudden he's dead. What happened? Here's the story. So it's parenthetical. So how did John the Baptist wind up dead? Well, King Herod had, a, I guess what you would call a fascination with John the Baptist. And how could you not? John the Baptist was an enigmatic figure. The way that he dressed, the message that he preached, there was no one like him. He was more like an Old Testament prophet in, in the likeness of an Elijah than he was a, a New Testament prophet or a preacher or a rabbi or anything like that. And remember, too, Israel had a long history of fire-breathing prophets going all the way back to the very beginning of their history. God had always sent these great prophets to the nation of Israel. There had been a steady stream of them. And then there was nothing. Over 400 years of not a prophet. The last time they had a 400-year break, they were slaves in Egypt. And now they got a 400-year gap where they don't hear there's no prophets. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist shows up, and he's just a figure from another era. You know, if we had a, a guy show up here today dressed like people did 400 years ago, we'd think, dude, you need medication or something because you're, <laughs> woo. You know, we might find some of those guys up in the city, I don't know, dressed like that, we think that there's something wrong. We get we get a lot more of the story in places like uh, Matthew chapter 14 fills in a little bit for us too, uh, because there's the same story. Matthew chapter 14 verses 1 to 12. Also Luke chapter 9 verses 7 to 9. We get a little bit more backstory too. But Herod, he had wanted to hear Jesus for himself. He'd heard about him. How could he not? And he wanted to hear from him personally. And ultimately, he did. Uh, so w whatever he is, he's thinking at this particular point, it says King Herod had heard of him, for his name had become well known, uh, but he didn't have a chance to actually hear him personally. He finally did. In Luke chapter 23. And here's an interesting, here's an interesting scenario. Finally. Jesus faces Herod. And so when uh, it says here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 6, when Pilate heard uh, of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. So here we've got, you know, at least a year to two years, Herod had been, uh, had heard about from the time of John the Baptist onward, no, no more than three. And finally he gets an opportunity to speak to him directly. So there, Luke 23, verse 9, he says, Then he questioned him with many words. But he, Jesus, answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. You know, you've heard me say here many times, when somebody's giving you grief, somebody's in your grill on for some subject, they're trying to get you to react or respond. And I always like to say, if you don't hit the ball back, then it's not a game. And after a while, they just get tired of it. Here it is. Luke chapter 23. Jesus never even gave them the opportunity to enjoy what they did. So they ended up with, you know, where most people end up when they've got nothing left to fling at you, when none of the, the poop sticks to you, then all they got... <laughs> it's Thursday night. All, all they got left is to mock you. And you know, the minute somebody begins to mock you and call you names, it's because they no longer possess the intellectual, emotional, or spiritual capacity 
to have a rational conversation. They're, they're out of ammo. They've, they've shot everything they've shot and nothing to hurt you. And so they got nothing now. So if you don't hit the ball back, it's not a game. So if someone wants to accuse you, someone wants to yell at you, someone wants to scream at you. The best thing in the world, the hardest thing in the world to do is not to respond. And if you don't respond, it's no fun anymore. You're no fun anymore. Dad, get out of my sight. Had enough of you. Awesome. God bless you. Don't say that. God bless you. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Don't pray for me. Pray for you. <laughs> Don't say prayer. Prayer. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've met people like that. Now, what got John put in prison? Now, same thing, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Same thing here in Mark chapter 6. John did something that Herodias didn't like. John stood up publicly in front of Herod because Herod loved to listen to John preach, which is fascinating to me because he went on and we can only guess what his message was because John had one message, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And John the Baptist had the gall to stand there in front of Herod, verse 18, and say, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now that's fascinating to me because Herod had taken his brother Philip's wife Herodias to be his own. And so John didn't argue with, he didn't try to nuance the discussion. He wasn't talking about the rights of a ruler like Herod. He just stood up and said, that's wrong. That's wrong. Now I might add here that one of the roles of Christians in this world is to be willing to stand up and to not be afraid to say that something is wrong. And in this day and age, the culture that we live in, that's not a very popular thing to do. Because everybody thinks, well, that's, you're judging me. Don't judge me. Jesus said, judge not, lest ye be judged. I even read an online blog from a guy. He said he was a Christian. I believe he was a Christian. And he said, in, right at the beginning of his blog, he said, we should never, ever, ever, ever judge anything. And I, and I was thinking to myself, okay, so you go to get that barbecued chicken breast that you left in your refrigerator six months ago and it's got a full head of hair should you judge that as being edible or inedible because if you say it's inedible you're judging and we should never ever judge anything now obviously I don't think that's what he meant by that I'm being uh, facetious but when someone says to me, when I you know, have the opportunity to say, no, you know, I, I think that's wrong. Someone says, well, that's, you're judging. I say, no, no, actually I'm not. God's word has already made the judgment. God's word has said that is wrong. And so it's not actually me that's making that judgment. It's God's word that's making that judgment. And then the second part of the argument is, that's just your interpretation. Then my next response is, okay, here. You, you read this, and you tell me what is your interp what's your interpretation. Here, read this right here. Read about, yeah, read about those first 20 verses right there, and you tell me what you think that means. What is your interpretation of that? Oh, well, that's just a book written by men. We don't really you know, see how that goes. They don't want to engage the text itself. They don't, they don't want to look at it for themselves. They just want to hold their opinion without their opinion being challenged. See, now, today, see if this doesn't make sense to you. Today, what tolerance means is you agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, that means you hate me. If you don't agree with me, 
you hate me. Now the funny thing is, is, and I've tried this out and I didn't get very far with it, I said, okay, so if you disagree with me, that means you hate me. <laughs> no, no, that's not it at all. Well, you said that, you know, I hate you because I disagree with you, but I don't hate you, I just disagree with you, but you're disagreeing with me, so I guess you hate me then. You know, th those conversations ultimately really don't get anywhere. But Christians are called, we have the right, certainly in America. In other countries, you might get your head cut off for it. But in this country, you don't. Not yet, anyways. And so we have the right, the privilege, the honor, to stand up publicly and say, I think that's wrong. And you guys know, because we've talked about it here before, it's not what you say, it's how you say what you say. Because you can say, it's wrong! Or you can say, no, that's, that's wrong. It's how you say what you say, not, not what you say. Now, in the case of John, he stood up and said, Herod, it's not right. It's unlawful. It's against God's law for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Now, that cost him his life. Herod was fascinated with John. He feared John. He wanted to protect John. He even said, it even said that he, he did. Uh, Herod, uh, Herodias held it against him, but Herod feared John, verse 20, knowing that he was a just and a holy man. Look, the best protection in the world, we were talking about it just Tuesday night, the best protection in the world is a life of integrity. You live a life of integrity where no man and no devil has anything that he can accuse you of. Ah, oh, there's always going to be something. I get that. I get that. But the question then becomes, are we even trying? Are we trying to be men and women of integrity so that when people do accuse us, it just doesn't stick? The accusations just don't stick. When someone comes up and says, yeah, you know, uh, you know I was talking, uh, you know, I know that guy, Dick Paulson, and he's just such a mean, such a mean man. And anybody that knows Dick is going to go, you obviously are talking about a different Dick Paulson. Because Dick Paulson, I know, is just a big old teddy bear. <laughs> right, Dick? <laughs> But Herod, even though he was fascinated by John, and he feared him, and I, think, and I think that that's what will happen. I think when Christians are really people of integrity, when we live really a holy and a godly life, really, genuinely, then people will be fascinated by that because they don't think that it can be done. And so when they see it, it's weird to them. They, they automatically assume that you're a hypocrite. You can't possibly be a person of integrity because nobody is a person of integrity. But as they watch you and observe your life, they find out that, no, you, you really are. Even when you fail, you're still a person of integrity, even in your failure. And then they're going to fear you. Now they don't want to be around you. Because every time you're around, their heart gets convicted. That's why they don't ask you your opinion about things, because they know what they're going to hear. And they don't want to hear what you have to say, because it's convicting. They feel it in their conscience. Anytime they're around, you know... I don't know what it is about you, but I don't like you. Conviction. Because wherever it is that you are, Christ is there also. Because he dwells in your heart by faith. So there is Jesus. You bring Jesus in to whatever situation you happen to be in, and some people are going to freak him out. They're going to be offended by that. They're going to fear you. And it's not you. It's Christ in you. Herod didn't want to execute John, but he was in this situation, and his wife, who clearly was a manipulator, knew what to do with this situation, and Herod was busted. And what happened is, even though Herod had a conscience, he feared John. He admired John. He was fascinated by John. So he had a conscience about John. But here's the point. Here's what happened. Sin won over his conscience. Sin won over his conscience. He had two things to choose from. He could choose sin or he could choose his conscience. And sin won. And it was really, ultimately, it was his own pride 
the one. Because of his oaths, because of the things that he had said, verse 26, verse 26, because of his oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Because I was a blabber mouth and I said anything up to half my kingdom and this is what she asked for and now I'm supposed to go, oops, sorry, I didn't really mean what I said, even though he's the king. You can't do that, can you? You know the old Irish proverb, better to keep your mouth closed and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and dispel all doubt. <laughs> Some, it's an Irish proverb, I'm sure of that. <laughs> I've dispelled all doubt so many times in my life. So. <laughs> Sin won over his conscience. Let me ask you something. Answer it for yourself. Is there a sin or sins that keep gaining victory over your conscience? Is there a sin or sins that keep gaining victory over your conscience? Could be as simple as pride. That's what it was for Herod. He didn't want to go back on his word because he opened up his mouth and he said so. Now he's got to do it. Rather than standing up like a man or like a Christian man and saying, you know what, I apologize. I never should have said that. Boy, that's integrity. Integrity admits when it makes a mistake and is willing to ask for forgiveness. Integrity will humble him or herself and say, I apologize. I never should have said that. If there's any other way that I can make it up to you, I will, but I can't do that. I never should have said it. I admit it. That freaks people out too because you don't ever see it. You know when people ask for forgiveness? It's when they get caught. Instead of standing up and saying, you know what, I said something I should not have said. And now I ask for your forgiveness. Is there a sin or sins that keep gaining victory over your conscience? Your conscience keeps telling you the same thing, and yet you keep stumbling in that same thing. That's Herod's curiosity. Point number two, and you were wondering if there is a point, and there is. Point number two, and that's Herod's party. Herod's party. So he's, he, he throws a bash at his place. And uh, it's his birthday. And if you're the king, um, then you go all out. I mean, you hire a DJ. Uh, you've got limos. Um, you have the whole thing catered. Uh, you know, you've got the A-list people that are all showing up at your house. Red carpet out front, paparazzi going off. Everything's going to turn up on, uh, you know, on TMZ uh, before midnight tonight. Um, viral videos of the big party and everything. And so here, here first century uh, viral videos. So there, there's here. He's throwing, he's throwing a bash. And Herodias, Herodias, she's got an idea. And she is an opportunistic woman. She is a scheming woman. She had held it against John, verse 19. Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. So there's a frustrated desire. There's a frustrated desire. Let me tell you something. Sometimes as Christians, God will frustrate your desires. He will not allow you to have what you want. And you may be going, no, no, this is the, I really want to do this. And God's saying, no, you are not. And I'm not going to let you. Sometimes he'll frustrate your desires. And you sometimes wonder why in your life, why do I feel like I'm not making any progress in my life? Everything is so frustrating. In my, maybe it's because you're trying to do something God simply doesn't want you to do. You ever thought about that? I'm trying to do what the Lord wants me to do. And he wants me to do this. Well, maybe he doesn't. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you need to give that up. Herodias waited she waited in the background for her opportunity, and it came. She manipulated Herod in front of his guests, and he couldn't back out of the deal. She brings in her daughter, Salome, come in, dance for the old man. You know how much he loves dancing girls. Come in and dance for the old man, and let's see what happens. And do that whole seven veil thing I've seen you do. Because that seven veil thing's a killer. And I think he's the kind of guy that would go for something like that. 
So her daughter comes in, and you know, I don't know, you know, what kind of mom it is that parades her daughter in front of her husband like that. It just seems a little weird to me. And she had to be a super good dancer. I mean, this we're beyond dancing with the stars at this point. I mean, she already was a star. And for a tip, he says, up to half the kingdom. Up to half the kingdom. And she could have said, okay, half the kingdom. <laughs> I don't know why she didn't do that. Because, you know, Herodias, in her single-minded rage to kill John the Baptist, she's not thinking rationally, because rational thought would have been half the kingdom. That would have been, then you can do anything you want with half the kingdom. No, no, she was so bitter and so angry and that madness overwhelmed her rational thinking that all she could think of, forget how, I don't want half the kingdom, I want that man's head. And Herod was a swine, admittedly. He was manipulated by his wife and her daughter and it cost John his life. But let's observe something else here, and that is how bitterly someone can hate those who oppose their views. All John said was, it's not lawful. That's all he said. He didn't say, I am going to protest outside of your palace every day. We are going to boycott you we're going to run ads in all the papers, and we are going to bring you down. He just said, it's not lawful. Period. That's it. That's it. And his integrity enraged her. Simply because he told her, and Herod, what you're doing is not right. Don't ever underestimate how much disagreement can enrage someone. We see this so much today, and I, you know, I, I don't talk really about politics. Uh, I don't really bank off too much into current affairs and things like that. But I'm telling you, there are streams of information that flow through the web, through TV, through radio, through print. There are narratives that flow through the media to public consumption and if you disagree with that narrative watch out watch out because now you're the problem you become the problem when you disagree with their narrative here's this here's how things are and here's why things are the way that they are and you have to agree with that if you disagree with that, you are the enemy. I disagree with that. Then you're the enemy. I don't think your narrative is correct at all. I think it's mythology. I think it's, a, it's the narrative that you want to tell that doesn't always necessarily bear witness to the facts. People believe what they want to believe about Jesus regardless of the facts. Believe me, I engage people on this topic regularly. The facts don't matter. They're not interested in the facts. What they're interested in is what they think the facts are. I can't remember who said it. You know, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. And people would rather have their own opinions and treat that as a fact than have their opinion altered by the facts. Does that make sense? People want to embrace what they want to embrace, and they're going to treat that as sacred, even if it's irrational, even if it's not true. Now, they'll tell us the same thing, and then we can trot out all the different things that we think are true and why we think they're true, and then they'll say, oh, you're just a bunch of narrow-minded bigoted. But, you know, it comes right back again to the same thing. You can't engage in a rational conversation, so you just got to call me names. This is the world that we live in right now. Somebody wrote a, uh, an editorial on some blog about, um, or some news site, about, you know, it's now a post-Christian nation. This has been a post-Christian nation for a long time. We, we have not been anything close to a Christian nation for a long, long time. And ultimately, remember, nations can't be Christian. Only people can be Christian. 
And there was a time when the majority of people that lived in this country were either Christians or they held a Christian world view. That changed a long time ago. It has not been that way for many, many years, even decades. So if you, if you think, well, we're a Christian nation. No, we're not, and we haven't been for a long time. And the reality is we probably never will be again. The goal is not to make this a Christian nation. I don't want to make America a Christian nation. I want to make you a Christian. I want individual people to be Christians. And when there's more individual Christians, then there's more people that will be taking the Christian worldview. Would I like to see the United States different than it is now? Sure, you bet. Of course I would. But that's not going to happen by electing people to political office. It's going to happen when people become Christians, when we lead them to Christ for salvation. That's when things change. Sorry, that was kind of a... Woo. All John said was, it's not lawful. It's not right. No threat of judgment, just saying that he was wrong. And people don't like it when you tell them that they're wrong. People don't like it when you tell them that the things that they're doing are a sin. God says that's a sin. People don't like it when you disagree with them. It costs John his life. So what I wanted to do very briefly here for the remainder of the study here is I just wanted to review John the Baptist. That's point number three, the John the Baptist review uh, with dancing girls and laser lights. The John the Baptist review. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know you could do that back there, Kurt. You could come up with something up there. So let's, let's just review very briefly John the Baptist because he's such an amazing and, and interesting character. And he plays such a massive role, but there's so few passages in Scripture that he actually occupies. And so I'm just I'm fascinated by that. So a couple of things to think about John the Baptist. First of all was his role, his role. Now, uh, he was seen by many writers of the New Testament as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy concerning the one who would come before the Messiah, Matthew chapter 3. Now, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, here's what Matthew writes. He says, in the days of John the Baptist, or in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Interesting that here this man shows up, and all of a sudden he comes out of nowhere, literally. Really, he's, he's very random, you would say. That's just so random. And he shows up dressed like an Old Testament prophet, eating like an Old Testament prophet. I like the honey part, the locust thing. I don't know. And when they ask him, you know, who are you? Which was a reasonable thing to ask. Over in John chapter 1, he answered them. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? This is John chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in 
uh, Beth Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. John knew who he was. John knew who he was not. That's a good thing to know in life, isn't it? Good to know who you are, good to know who you're not. And perhaps the best known but least imitated characteristic of John the Baptist's life was the insight that we receive when he was speaking about his relationship to Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 30 where he said he must increase and I must decrease. Can you imagine standing in front of a classroom full of school kids today saying you must decrease. Can you imagine standing in front of graduating seniors in high school or MBAs, doctorate candidates in college and saying, you must decrease. Nobody says that. <laughs> I mean, that everybody says, you must increase. Go out and create increase. Increase for yourself. You can achieve anything. Increase as much as you want, any way that you want. Just go out there and increase, increase, increase. And John the Baptist says, I must decrease. Boy, talk about an unpopular message. It still challenges us today because we think, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that I, that I have to be a doormat, that I let other people walk? I mean, no, it doesn't mean that. It just means you need to be more full of Jesus than you are of yourself. Ouch. And you don't realize how full of yourself you are until you try to be less full of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> try it and see what happens and you'll see very rapidly how, how selfish you really are John had one purpose when he saw Jesus one purpose and it still is a rather similar purpose that you and I have today in John chapter 1 verse 29 when he said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world he pointed people to Jesus that's what he did he pointed people to Jesus he didn't point people to his ministry which we're going to get to here next. He didn't point people to himself or to his ministry. He didn't have a global conclave. He didn't have a private jet. He didn't have his own church. As a matter of fact, his church was made up of telling people to go away. Don't follow me. Follow him. How popular of a church would this be if I stood up every single Sunday and said, don't come here anymore. Just go out and follow Jesus. Heck, you guys might do it. <laughs> I'd really be in trouble. But John also had what appeared to be doubts. Matthew chapter 11. Turn over there. Matthew chapter 11. It's a fascinating passage. And uh, not so many years ago, uh, up to a point, I had a particular view on this passage. And now I've got another view on it. And uh, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, now it came to pass, Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison, so there's John, he'd already been arrested, he's in prison now. When John had heard uh, in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Huh. Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Interesting. John sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus a question. Now the question then becomes for us is... John doubting everything that he had believed up to that point. Because we knew that up to that point, uh, the narrative that we have of John's life before he's thrown into prison, there is no equivocation at all. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You want me to baptize you? You should be baptizing me. And let's not forget, John and Jesus were cousins. And they were born roughly at the same time, John just a little ahead of Jesus. Can you imagine these guys together at the family reunion? And they're looking at each other going, I'll see you later. Yeah, 
I guess you will. <laughs> you taking off, John? Yeah. Heading out into the wilderness for a while. Okay. I'll see you in a little while. I'll meet you down by the river. Okay, I'll see you then. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You gotta wonder. So, where is this coming from? Is John having doubts? Now, it could have been, it could have been, look, look, I did my best for him, and all I got was thrown in prison for this? Is, it, is this what I get for being a faithful servant? Thrown into prison? In his confinement, he'd heard bits and pieces of what Jesus was doing. I don't know uh, how the narrative worked or what the, the, the timeline exactly of this was. But at the start of his ministry, there was no equivocation. He knew exactly who Jesus was. Heck, they'd grown up together. And now here they are. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now he sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus this question. Are you the one or, or do we look for another? What's going on? Is John having doubts? Now, I give you another option, which to me is a fascinating option. Note that it says that John sent two of his disciples to ask this of Jesus. But up until this point, John chapter 1, verse 29, John chapter 3, verse 30, John had been pointing everyone to Jesus, not to himself. Is it possible that he sent these two disciples so that they would hear the answer? John didn't want disciples. John didn't try to make disciples. That was not his role. But here are two men that are still his disciples. Remember previously he told his disciples, go to him, follow him. But here are two guys. Is it possible that these are two guys that not, you know, we John, you know, we've been with you from the start. We, we're gonna we're gonna stick with you. And John is, nah, yeah, yeah, you're sticking with the wrong guy. So he says to them, Go ask Jesus a question for me. Ask him this, you two. You go ask him, are you the one? The one? Or should we wait for another? Now, you know me, I'm never afraid to speculate about things that I don't know. And I'm wondering if those two guys went to Jesus and asked him that question, and you see the answer. Go tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Was that answer for those two disciples? Was John sitting there in prison going, they know now. Are those two disciples, the two guys that never, did they ever go back to John and report to him at all? We have no record of it. Or did they finally get it? We've been following the wrong guy. All along, John's been saying, follow you, follow you. And we haven't been. And now when we hear this answer from you, we're going to follow you now. And not John. Is it possible that he sent those two disciples so that they would see, so that they would hear the answer for themselves, thus prying them loose from John and following Jesus as they ought to? It's interesting, isn't it? What's the answer? I don't know. I don't have an answer. But I like to think that John did not doubt. We may never know. The end result is the same. He was beheaded. The end result was the same. So that brings us to his legacy. Because also in Matthew chapter 11, right after Jesus answered those disciples, it says there in Matthew 11 verse 7, Jesus departed, he began to say to the multitudes concerning John. Here is Jesus' eulogy, if you were, about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? I love this. A reed shaken by the wind? That's like a rhetorical question because John was anything but a reed shaken by the wind. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. 
But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he was least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one of their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned for you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> Wisdom is justified by your children. Wow. John the Baptist was a popular, or excuse me, John the Baptist was not a popular preacher. He was a true preacher. I like that better. He gained a kind of notoriety and certainly people went out to hear him. But he was a true preacher because he never equivocated. He never, he never softened the truth for the sake of gaining disciples for himself as many pastors are likely to do. Look, every pastor wants to preach to a full church. I'm no different than anybody. I want a full church. I love to preach to a, a packed house. But is that why I'm doing it? So that I can have a full house? Because if I stand up here and say what I say for the sake of trying to get a full house, I'm not a true preacher. Now I'm just a hireling. I'm just like anybody else. Anybody can do that. Jesus' eulogy of John was stirring. And to have Jesus say things like that about him makes me stop and think, what does Jesus say about me? What is Jesus' eulogy of me? Hmm, Brian, what did you go out to Half Moon Bay to see? A reed shaken? No, I can't use that one. He was shaken. Uh, somebody in soft... No, he did have soft clothes. Uh... What did you go out to see? Uh, prof, well, no, they were a non-profit organization. Uh, what did you go out to see with Brian? Hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I don't know what, what Jesus would say about me, but uh, I, I know what I would hope that he would say about me. But let me finish with this. Uh, back again in Mark chapter 6 is his death. He's beheaded because of this woman who did not like being told what to do or what not to do. And John's death, while tragic, completed the ministry that was given to him by God. And when we are done, God will take us home too. He never promised how he would take us home. He just promised that when we're done, he'll take us home. Are you afraid of that? Now, I don't think that I'm afraid of dying. I don't think that I am. I am afraid of how I might die. I don't want to burn to death. I do not want to be eaten by a shark. Um, that just creeps me out. So apart from that, I'm, I'm almost good with just about anything. Well, I did, yeah, I did. No more. Too much information. Head chopped off. Okay. Head chopped off. That's quick. That's quick. That's quick and easy. Um, yeah, it depends on how they. Yeah, it depends on how they do it. Yeah, and and I told I I even told my doctors too. I said, look, you know, there's, you know, I don't mind dying. There's just certain ways I don't want to die. I won't tell you what I told him. So, John the Baptist seemed to fear no man. So I doubt that he feared death. If he was willing to stand up in front of the king and say what you're doing is wrong. That's a certain way to get your head lopped off. He was given a unique ministry, John the Baptist was, but is his ministry any different than yours or mine? Let's think about it. John's death seems ignoble compared with the role that he played in the eulogy that Jesus gave him. 
But what are we laboring for? What are, what are we trying to do? Recognition on earth or reward in heaven? Because let me tell you something. Laboring for the Lord, serving him, you may never, ever get as much as a pat on the back on this planet. And I got to tell you, uh, being a pastor for a long time, if there's one thing that you receive more than anything else as a pastor, without question, and I'm not just up here to be whining about it, uh, if the, probably the number one thing that, that I've received over the years of being a pastor is discouragement. It's probably the number one thing that I've received. Discouragement. And, you know, it's, it's part and parcel with the ministry. But I'll tell you, when you get those moments those little pauses where you get an encouragement it absolutely cancels out all the discouragement i'll tell you about one and and, and i really can't explain it but i'll tell you anyways got done on a sunday morning up here and in, in i'm telling you i felt as if my message was a complete waste of time i stepped out of the pulpit thinking I, that was horrible. That was just horrible. I, I, why would anybody? When I'm, people are running for the doors. I can see them all running for the doors. It was so horrible. I just I felt bad. I, I felt embarrassed. I felt like I just wasted everybody's time. And somebody here in the church, on their way out the door, they looked at me, gave me a nod, and they said, "Good job." And in that moment. I was completely lifted, completely lifted. And I have no idea why. I can't really properly explain that to you. But it was just the right word at the right time. Now, I'm not saying that because I want you all to come up and encourage me afterwards. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we can be sources of encouragement for others, and we need to be. Because the Christian life is not easy. It's the hardest, most challenging thing there is. But is that why we do it? Is that why we're Christians? To have somebody else come up to me and say, good job. Is that why I do it? Because I want someone to say that to me? Or am I doing this now so that when I stand before my Savior in heaven, Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, he looks at me and says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. I cannot imagine hearing anything that would be more occurring, something, something that would absolutely obliterate any kind of discouragement or darkness or pain or agony or trial or tribulation, anything, a lifetime of discouragement dispelled in one word. Well done. Two words. <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant. And if we choose heaven as our reward, why do we act as if we still want the recognition here? And why would we be surprised when we don't get it and in fact get the opposite? John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world you will have tribulation. 2 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It'll come. Sooner or later, some way or the other, some point or the other. So we've got this parenthetical section on John the Baptist and what an amazing and interesting guy he was and yet how much like his ministry is ours. What's our ministry? To point people to Jesus. That's our ministry. Get out of the way. I must decrease. He must increase. And the only way I can do that is to push you towards Jesus. It's my job as a pastor to push you towards Jesus. Not to this church, not to me. You don't follow me. God forbid anyone follows me. It's your job, my job, to tell people, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase. I must decrease. You follow him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be good and faithful servants of yours. We want to hear you say that when we arrive in heaven, Lord. But, Lord, I know for myself, I am awfully full of myself sometimes. 
And Lord, it's a, even kind of a scary thing to pray that you would help me to decrease. Lord, but I know that as I do, you will increase. And what a greater thing that is. So Lord, help us not to be afraid of fulfilling the same ministry that you call us to as John the Baptist. Help us not to fear, Lord, uh, standing up for the truth and saying, no, that's not right. Help us never to be afraid of pointing people in the right direction. Don't do that. Instead, follow him. Lord, help us never to be afraid of that. But also, Lord, help us never be afraid of suffering the consequences that may come along with that. So we pray for your help. We believe that you will. You've given us your Holy Spirit, your enabling power. So we trust that you'll do this in us, Lord. Now use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.